All right. And we are live in the green room today with my friend, John Worley. Oh. <laughs> You've had quite the day today. Well, you know, it was a really interesting <laughs> day. Um, I had all these ideas uh, how I was going to get all of this stuff ready for this conversation with you. And then with my internet going out and having to go find a new cable modem, which turns out to be a real challenge in these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that. any other time we would have been able to just drive out to the store and grab a cable modem or whatever, but not now. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do this uh, just to start the show. Uh, everybody can see you. And I put your, uh, your website link up there. Okay. But, but I'm going to show this and I don't know, you might not be able to see this, but here, let me, let me show this to you. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to make this so people can see it. And this is, this is how you and I first, this is what we did when we first met. And here it is. Whoops. Sorry. There we go. John Worley, when he was, I don't how old were you when we first did the circus together? But that was 1980, right? Yes. I was 25. Oh, you're way older than me. <laughs> oh. No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. You say, Sonny? <laughs> All right. So, so here, we, we got to start that when I first met John, uh, I, I had been called to go do the circus and uh, the band leader, Steve Curl said, meet us in Colorado Springs. My parents uh, drive me out in my, my van, my truck or whatever it is with my drums and a suitcase of clothes. And they just drop me off and I find out where this Airstream trailer is and they go, okay, just that's where you're going to go sleep. I open the door. <laughs> And you, and you, you, you were sitting at the table and you went, Not the goddamn door. you're letting all the flies in. <laughs> I just got through killing about a thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was the funniest thing. And I go, and then you go, well, who are you? What are you doing? I'm, well, I'm the new drummer. Oh, okay. I mean, that was, <laughs> and, and, and then the, the picture I just showed, uh, was me I think I took a picture of you when you guys played the show before I started and I think mm. that, that photo and then uh, and I told this we talked this story with with Tom and I, again I'd only known you a day right or two days because my, my first thing was you know shut the door you're gonna let all the flies in <laughs> but then I played my first show and I was horrible i was awful i mean i just it just you know i could not have done a worse job and everybody's oh man what are we going to do so uh in between the first show and the second show i go out to get go to the bathroom and get some water and i come back and all you guys are standing in a circle and tom remembered he goes yeah i remember that you were all standing in a circle and i start heading over towards you and the bass player start walks up to me and he puts his hand out and he goes, uh, you don't want to go over there. And I go, well, <laughs> I go why? He says, because they don't, they're talking about whether they're going to let you play the next show or not. <laughs> right? Okay. So, um, uh, then, then this is, this is where the John Worley that I know, uh, and have loved ever since the kind of person you are, I'm just, I'm setting this up. So you walk over and you you come to me and you put your hand on my shoulder and you go, look, we're going to work this out. You know, grab your book of music. And I don't know if you remember this, but you took me over. We went over and sat down on some rocks and we went through the book and you played the parts and I got my drumsticks and you worked on on getting me through the show for, uh, you know, the next week when you, we started right away before the next show. And and you completely saved me. Uh, otherwise, I would have been just stuck in Albuquerque, New Mexico with a set of drums. <laughs> that would have been a bummer. It would have been. But, yeah. 
but that led me to being there for a long time and and uh, how long how long did you play for uh i don't remember that was august of 81 i finished the year and then went the entire next year with a like a two-month break when i got sick and kent bryson Bryson filled in for me while Mm -hmm. i um so i played most of 81 i started 81 and ended 81 a couple months off Mm. it was the beginning of a lifelong friendship with you and i know and i remember when we drove up to your house and and i and i met your parents (laughs) you know i don't know they were really nice to all you guys they were and what Pulitzer and i drove up there together that's right yeah yeah we were we had that white little car that toyota or not or D, Datsun or whatever it was I don't know. dodge it, it was, was a dog it was a little no. dodge um colt oh really yeah it, oh okay it it looked like a like a little nissan or Datsun or something but i think it was um it might have even been made by nissan or Datsun. Mm. was i think it was a dodge colt mm-hmm. john or maybe tom would be able to uh fill us in on that by the mm-hmm. way, uh, I may open up the phone and let some people call in along the way. Oh, okay, sure. That'll be interesting. Oh, boy. The past comes to haunt one, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, so this is the thing that that I always knew about you. As much as you would joke and you would tease, and, and we had some really great times and some great laughs, but you had such an expansive open heart. And the one thing that I always remember about you during the circus, because I got frazzled a lot, you would always just put your hand on my shoulder and go like, you know, it's going to be okay. We'll, we'll work on this. And, and um, anybody that knows you knows you to be a, a really calm guy. I mean, you don't, you seem, or at least in those music moments, especially uh, you were always really calm and you composed and like, there was nothing going to bother you. And, mm. and then the other thing that I always remember, and then this is, I'm going to open, I'm setting you up to have a, tell us about your trumpet playing. Um, but the one thing that you always told me is I'm happiest when I play my horn. All I want to do is be able to play my horn. I just, I just love playing trumpet and that's all I really want to do. And that's all you've ever done. So now, how did you start playing trumpet and what got you in, interested in it and all of that sort of thing? How did you, what was your inspiration? My, my inspiration was this, we got this book in the mail and it was in the summer. And my parents, we had, I grew up in San Francisco in Daly City, but for a couple of years, we moved up to Rona Park because my dad, He was a country boy, you know, from uh, Pensacola. And so um, he wanted to get out into the country a little bit more. And um, and I remember we got this book in the mail. It was this big square book called Reader's Digest Treasury of Short Stories. And on the back, there was a picture of Louis Armstrong playing his trumpet. And I thought, wow, look at that. What a pretty, pretty horn, you know, and and I thought, wow, I'm going to read that story. So I read the story and. and it talked about how he could go anywhere in the world and through his music, people would understand who, you know, what he was thinking or what he was feeling. And I was a pretty shy kid, which is kind of hard to believe these days, you know, but, you know, <laughs> but I was a pretty shy kid. I didn't talk very much. I was a voracious reader and, and stuff. And I thought, wow, you know, I really want to, I really want to play the trumpet. And at that time I was playing drums. And yeah, in, in fourth grade, and uh, I was playing drums, and that was really a lot of fun. And I used to set up my dad, my, my mom and dad's coffee cans, you know, the MJB cans with the plastic lids. Yeah. And I had them set up around me, and I would pretend I was uh, Ringo Starr playing with my mom's chopsticks. <laughs> <laughs> and then so, so the, but then, then the next year, we moved back to Daly City, and... And I told my mother, I would really love to play the trumpet. And she says, okay. I said, can you go and rent me a trumpet? She says, sure. So she was supposed to have it for me for my first class on October 1st, 1965. And she was a day late. 
and I got it October 2nd, you know, and I remember putting the mouthpiece in it and blowing into it and there was nothing coming out of it, just a bunch of air. And I said, mom, I think this trumpet's broken. And she said, oh, no, you just got to learn how to play it. And I said, okay. And so um, I've been playing it ever since, 1965. Yeah. yeah. And I love playing the trumpet, but I really love playing a flugelhorn. Really? Oh, my God. I love the flugelhorn. It's, it's more like my voice. The trumpet, you know, it's a, it's a really bright sound. It's brassy, and it's really fun, and it's loud and everything. But, you know, when, when you sit down and you play a beautiful ballad, mm. you know, it has that round, soft, sensual sound. You know, I'm not going to get any more into it than that, but, you know, it was, it was just beautiful, you know. So, but, um, yeah, so it's been, been, you know, I mean, but one thing that you said was uh, um, how I don't want to do anything else, or I said that, you know, years and years ago, right? Well, you know, things have changed, you know, in the sense where I'm married, and one of the things that I love to do is spend time with my wife. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as much as I love the trumpet, you know, the nice thing about growing older is you start to appreciate more things around you and they carry just as much meaning as, as well for the trumpet, you know, for me. And, and believe me, you know, I'm never going to quit playing the trumpet. Right. Never, ever, ever. I love the trumpet. I love flugelhorn. I love playing music. Doesn't matter what kind of music it is. I'm never going to quit. You know? So, so, where did you go to school in Daly City? Yeah. And you graduated mm -hmm. from high school and you played in, the in and all that sort of thing? Yeah. I, yeah. My first teacher was a guy named Dick Snyder. And Dick was a, you know, he taught a lot of the elementary school kids and he was a professional saxophonist, but he also doubled on a valve trombone and played all the other doubles and stuff. And so I remember um, about a month into it, I went up to Dick and I said, you know, Mr. Snyder, I think I have to quit playing trumpet. And he said, why? And I said, well, because it's making me cough. You know, I was trying to cop out, you know. <laughs> and so he looked at me, he goes, you'll get over it. Just keep playing, you know. And so years later, my band uh, had a gig at the um, at that museum, the Young Museum in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. And um, we were playing this outdoor concert. And um, I know we're on break and I'm hanging out, standing and standing around talking to people. And I saw this old guy shuffling over towards me. Right. And it turns out <clears throat> I looked at him and I thought, oh, my God, that's Dick Snyder. And he walks up and he goes, hi, John, how are you doing? And I said, oh, man, Dick, how are you? How you been? And he goes, pretty good. I said, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, I was playing. Um, my gig with the park band and I saw your name on a poster. So I thought I'd walk over and see how you're doing just out of the blue, you know, <laughs> and what a trip that was, man, you know, and, and of course I, you know, I always thanked him when, whenever I would see him because, because he would be on some gigs, you know, that I was really um, lucky to be on, you know, with the older cats. Yeah. You know, yeah. Back, back in the day and stuff, you know? So, so uh, after high school, you went to college in, in, uh, you went to Cal State LA, is that correct? I went. I I went to a bunch of colleges. I never graduated with a degree other than an associate of arts, mm -hmm. and uh, I just went to these schools because they had great bands. Uh -huh. Did for instance, like Skyline College, mm -hmm. College of San Mateo. That's where I met Fred Berry, mm -hmm. who's been a real inspiration and a um, and a mentor to me for all these years since 1973. Um, I went to De Anza College and studied with Herb Patnow. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, Herb. And then and then Cal State LA. And, you know. and the only reason why I mentioned Cal State LA is because I that's where you uh, wasn't Tom and Howard Suspense <clears throat> and a bunch of guys weren't you all going to school there? Didn't did you meet all those? That's where you were when you went to the circus, I think. Yeah, no, I met I met Howard and Louis Fasman. And a, and a bunch of other young musicians uh, at Marriott's Great America. Oh. Yeah. My good friend, Mike Alice Addis, had played there the opening season. And he told me about it and said, this is, you know, these are, there are a lot of great players there, you know. And at the time, I was playing um, cumbia gigs, you know, in San Jose. 
<laughs> I know, I know it's a trip, you know. And uh, so, yeah, El Combo Universitario, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that that had its moments. I really enjoyed that, you know. Yeah. And um, but so I I decided well, I was going to audition for for the show, you know. I mean for for uh, Marriott. So, you know, I got I got second trumpet in the Broadway show which was really fun. And I remember the first, first day, one of the first days I was there, there was this young trumpet player, skinny guy, and he's like wailing double A's and G's and double C's and double D's and all this stuff, just farting around, you know, he's kind of hyper, you know? Yeah. And I walked up to him and I said, man, you sound great. What's your name? He says, oh, my name's Louis Fathman. I said, my name's John Worley, man. I got to tell you, you know, you sound great. And, you know, that was the start of a lifelong friendship. And all my students know that I'm when they when they leave the studio and a new trumpet player comes in. I, I ask them to introduce themselves to the to the to the person, you know, to the to the next student. And then, you know, and that way, you know, they they meet somebody that they could maybe be friends with. You know, sometimes when you go and you're doing competition someplace. You don't know anybody you're scared you know you're gonna crap your pants you know you're so scared you know yeah. and stuff and then you see somebody that you know that you met in my studio and there's somebody you can go talk with or something you know or or like sometimes i tell them i said i said hey man you ought to you ought to get to know this person this person's a good trumpet player you know they might be able to turn you on to an easter gig and make 300 bucks what could you do with 300 dollars? and of course their eyes bug out you know <laughs> <laughs> you know Fox. <laughs> yeah, but but no, I met I met Lewis there. I met Howard at Great America because he was in the drum and fife band, you know, and he sure looked pretty damn funny in one of those three corner hat things, you know. <laughs> yeah. And Paul Itzer, I met, he was going to Foothill College along with Dave Woodley and a couple other guys. And um and so when when um Lewis and I and Derek Wadman moved down to um to LA to go to Cal State LA. You know, uh, Pulitzer and Howard was already there. Tony Mack, a really fine trumpeter, was there from uh, from De Anza. And uh, Tom actually went to Foothill College. Yo, right, right, with um, yeah, with um, Terry Suma. Terry Suma, yeah, 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 so, yeah. Another another great educator and a really fine person. Yeah, right. right. Um, so you guys were at, and the reason why I'm I'm kind of leading up to Cal State LA is because somehow you all were there, and somebody came there and said, "Come do the circus." How did they get all you guys' names? I mean, what, how how did that come about? The whole circus. I, you know, I'm not. I don't. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it could have been Jim Miller. It could have been through Jim Miller. But all I remember was some some guy, uh, Steve Curl, came in and said, "Hey, we're um, we are we're looking for musicians to go on the road with Circus Vargas, and um, and they don't want a circus band. What they want is they want a um, a Las Vegas style show group, you know, so that you're playing not just circus music, but you're playing pop music and and um, and." You know, and at the time, you know, I was working in the pub making pizzas, you know, playing a couple of gigs or something. But I made pizzas and served beer, kept my friends alive and drunk, you know. <laughs> and um, and so, um, you know, we went over and, and uh, we played for the guy, you know, whoever it was. And we we wound up getting the gig. And it was uh, Ron Christensen on trombone. And uh, I remember going out there with Jim Miller and I think some guy named Keith who plays bass down in LA. Mm -hmm. I think you might know this guy. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember Keith when, when I, I, I believe I did replace Jim Miller. Uh, mm -hmm. And the bass player at the time was uh, some kid that when I first joined was some kid on his way to Chicago, his name was John or something. Mm. Uh, I don't remember. There was a keyboard player for a short time. Do you remember there was a keyboard player there where they would, I forget his name, but it was really funny because he'd drag his keyboard up the 
you know, he 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 just drag it up the bleachers and throw it on the. I re I remember that guy. He lived in Glen Allen, which is by um, by Sonoma, and he would he was he was into uh, his cups, just just you know. He was into it, and he would work out. Remember, he had those big weights, and he put them on his stomach and do crunches and stuff, and go running and just work out like hell, and and come to the gig and and start drinking. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, that circus. It, it was it was a real trip. So you never did any of that because you were you were pretty straight ahead, you know. By, yeah, they were pretty straight ahead. Yeah, by that time, I my only. Um, I I only just got to sit and watch you guys. Like every every one of you guys were, you know. I don't want to spill a lot of stuff, but but let me just say, everybody in the band but me uh, was partaking in something, except for maybe Nils uh, and and Lynn uh, Keller. That they they were pretty straight, but the the horn players they were a different breed. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about circus is, I mean, it's an alternate reality to say the least, you know, and you had to be a tough guy in, in a lot of ways to be in the circus because it was rough, you know, I mean, it was really rough and, um, and as much fun as it was, it was pretty rough and, and it was, and the conditions were pretty, pretty tough to deal with too, you know, yeah. I'm kind of shaking when I'm thinking about all this, you know, you know, I remember being in lot in Oklahoma and, uh, some, some, uh, some guys came up to me in this restaurant and, uh, told me to get out of their way. Cause I was in the, cause they wanted to take my place in line. Right. And I said, what are you talking about, man? Shoot. You know, he goes, Hey man, you want to mess with us? And I said, no, I don't want to mess with you guys. Jeez, you know, okay, go, whatever, you know. And then some guy in, in, in the restaurant was from the circus, you know. And he comes running up. He says, hey, man, are these guys messing with you? And I said, um, well, whatever. Don't worry about it. I can take care of it, you know. And he says, no, nah, man, I'm going to go get the guys in the circus, you know, and we're going to take care of this. And I'm going, oh, man. And these guys are going, yeah, right. You know, he had this guy had five guys, around, right? Mm -hmm. And he was a tough guy. And um, and then about 10 minutes later, a crowd of about 25 or 30 people <laughs> came to the restaurant and went inside the restaurant. And, and then the, the guy goes, man, that's the guy. That's the guy that's messing with one of us. You know, and the guy's freaking out, you know, and the manager of the restaurants for everybody's freaking out. And I looked at everybody and I said, man, hey, come on. I said, we don't we don't need any trouble, man. And I and I asked the guy who was kind of picking on me. I said, are we cool? Can we just, you know, because we don't want any trouble. He says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they took off and I don't blame them, man. You know, you know, but it was a, it was a crazy existence, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the interesting thing is uh, we found out that a bunch of the, uh, uh, in, in one way, I guess you could call them carnies, but but they were the tent crew. You know, those guys had it worse than the musicians. Oh yeah. But they they traveled in a in a truck, and the trailer from this big semi truck was called the Hooch, and they you know they would all sleep in that in a bunch of bunks, and they would they had their own little place where they'd eat, and we usually eat there. And those guys, a lot of them were running from the law. You know, they, <laughs> they, the police would just show up and haul somebody off every now and then. And you go, what happened to that guy? Oh, you know, he was wanted for something, you know, in some place. But Tom, by the way, Tom, Tom is uh, talking here. He said, ask John about, they look like big effing rats. Do you remember? Hmm. And uh, Jeez. yeah, actually, I do remember that. I remember that. I remember we were uh, we were hanging out, and um, and the elephants were running around the hippodrome track. Oh. And I'm looking at them, thinking, "Oh my God, they look like big giant rats." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know. What can you say more than that? They look like big rats, you know, with big trunks. You know, the <laughs> one thing that you know, uh, John used to do some really crazy stuff. So, and it was, it was a musical thing that he would do. And uh, nobody would ever really know it other than the 
the acts themselves and us. And do you remember what were the two twins, the two little, uh, the two little German twins that did the, did the act? Oh yeah. 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 And they would do this thing and they'd walk up uh, these stairs and they would, it would be right in front of the band and turn around. And one of the girls, the, the lady's face would be like right at you. And you'd always lift your horn up and right in her face. Kind of. <laughs> did I do that? You did. <laughs> Really? Well, they well, the reason the reason is because they would come up and complain about their music every show. They would come up and complain. Oh, okay. And, and you don't you know why they complained? I don't remember. remember. Okay, because we had a thing where um we would play we would play the melody and stuff, and then we would take solos, right? And then sometimes uh, we would somebody would quote a tune and the whole band would switch gears like that and play that tune and then go back to the original tune, you know? So it was like, it was the first time I ever played in a band that was like a flock of birds. You know, we would, we would be cruising along with this one tune and playing it and something would happen to, and then everyone would go off in a different direction, you know? And we still, we still kept the groove and stuff, but we just play a different, different song. And, and that kind of freaked out some people, especially when, when you know, their timing with their acts. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really important for them to have, have you know, not get distracted, right? Right. So. Yeah. Well, um, Tom, Tom, Tom is commenting on your, on your, at some point I may make him just call in, but he goes, uh, you know, the story about the, the elephants being big F and rats. He goes, oh, come on, tell the whole story. <laughs> and, and. I, you know, I'm not, maybe that might be uh, something that Tom might have to tell, but um, uh, <laughs> the one thing that I remember. Uh, why I, I ought to. <laughs> well, this is a family show. This is a family show. <laughs> You know, uh, one thing that, and, and I don't remember what was going on with the horn players at this time, but, but one time Tom was standing in one corner and um, I don't remember if this, were you there when the, the, there was a dog act, uh, was there a dog act when you, this might've been the next year, but, um, <clears throat> there was this dog act and the dogs would go across this, uh, this wire. And, uh, if they stopped the rule of thumb for any animal being trained on a circus is you always make them finish the act. Right. Mm. So, right. So if the dog stopped halfway through his little high wire act, he would, I would have to do a drum roll and sit there while the guy got him to get the dog to move. And sometimes it would take five minutes and any kind of noise would get, make the dog stop. So Tom was on the other side of the bandstand and he had a pocket full of pennies and I do the drum roll. And then he'd just sit over there and, and, chuck the pennies across the stage at me trying to hit my snare drum to make a note <laughs> or a cymbal or something so, so the dog would stop and then i'd have to sit and do do the drum roll for another five ten minutes and so as he would pitch them i would try to keep the roll going <laughs> try to keep the pennies <laughs> you know but the 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 acts though would know we were doing this and they'd get mad at us they'd get mad yeah. at us dude, you know, get your drum roll together. <laughs> wow. You know, I wasn't that, I wasn't, I wasn't there for that year. You know? I mean, I did it, uh, 1980, uh, from July of 80 till, uh, December. And then the end of January to May, I think it was May and Louis Fassman took my place. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah and, um, well, then I came back in 83 and for a month, I think it was maybe no three months. And then, and then, um, and then back again in 85. And that's when uh, Roger Ingram was playing lead trumpet. And uh, well, we had a lot of great players. Joe Farrell sat in with us mm -hmm. and played and uh, Bruce Fowler and Jeff Jorgensen, that great saxophonist. Mm -hmm. holy moly man that was a and, and nils was on the gig nils yeah mm -hmm. the, the the first early part of 
81 is when the this photo that's that's floating around a lot uh, on the internet uh, on our facebook pages this one of the the four of us you uh tom and myself eric, eric jorgensen yeah and we went to a jazz club called uh, jazz at the Boojum tree right and, and it was part of the double tree hotel yeah it yeah it wasn't the uh the playboy club was there too wasn't it wasn't there a playboy club close on the top of mm, i don't remember a playboy club um uh but we went to see who do you remember who we went to see when sure we it was uh mose allison oh that was fun yeah that was great that was the first time i ever saw him play and 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 sing it was terrific yeah um so i uh the other thing that i remember and this was was a, a kind of a sad story but this is all part of the stuff that we we went through with, with the circus but you remember when we went to um uh we were in chicago and mm -hmm. you had spent a day or two days at shilke looking at horns do you remember and, try, and and i had and they made me a mouthpiece that i went there to get a mouthpiece made mm -hmm. and um um the gentleman who was a mouthpiece maker um he took me around and showed me the the one of the rooms that had all these different trumpets in there that uh put that were part of mr shoki's collection yeah, yeah. i remember that yeah and yeah. Uh, you also, though, you bought a you bought a horn someplace in Chicago. Yeah, it was from some guy, and it was a Shoki B five with a brilliant bell. And yeah. and you, what happened? You had just bought that horn, mm -hmm. stepped off of that airstream trailer, and it it was was a big step, and you missed the step somehow, and the horn dropped. Do you remember? Right. That? Oh sure, and it was after it was it was after we did that first show, and that trumpet was amazing. It was what a beautiful sound that thing had, and then it went up in the case, came down. I opened up the case, and the bell was completely crushed. Oh man! Because that brilliant that brilliant bell was 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 really super lightweight and thin, you know. Yeah, yeah. Never found a shoki that played as good as that since. Hmm. Yeah. And were you uh, when you had that horn fixed did it, it, it change the sound it just didn't ever sound it was like dead it was dead as a doorknob yeah yeah you know what i think is is interesting uh what a lot of people don't understand is uh and i've had this conversation with people about horns saxes and trumpets and and trombones and stuff where you have a specific instrument and they go well just go buy a new one it you know it isn't that simple mm -mm. each instrument is it's an instrument it's a piece of it's a craft and they mm -hmm. sound different mm -hmm. when you get a horn that sounds a certain way that's irreplaceable and if if you pay two thousand dollars for it there's a reason you pay two thousand dollars for it or four thousand or however right right and and you can't just go oh i'll just go get a new horn it just doesn't work that way yeah, you you usually go on a big search, you know. I have I have probably about thirty nine different instruments. Really? Yeah, yeah. I I'm a collector, but I have um, I I I work with Yamaha. I'm, I'm a Yamaha performing artist, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I love Yamaha trumpets. You know, I was a Bach uh, clinician, and then I played this one horn that I really liked. And uh, I waited six months, you know, to make sure. And so, and then I resigned from Bach and then I uh, applied to be a Yamaha, you know, person. And um, I, I love Yamaha trumpets. I have a bunch of them, you know, and, but I have the have one special one. It was the very first one that I got. Uh, and it was, um, I, I went and tried it out at the Atelier shop in LA in Buena Park. And uh, I was down there trying horns out for West Valley Music in, uh, in Mountain View. And Diana Tucker and I went down there and she said, you know, uh, she wanted me to help her, you know, get some pretty good horns and stuff for the store. And uh, so I tried a bunch of horns and she said, yeah, and if you find one, you know, just, and you want to buy it, go ahead and, you know, we'll just take it with us. And I said, okay. And so I'm playing all these different trumpets and, and all of a sudden I pick, a, pick this one up and I played it 
And she turned to me and she says, you should buy that horn. I said, you know, you're absolutely right. Just from the sound, you know, and that's my favorite, my favorite horn, my favorite trumpet. I've had it for almost 10 years now. It's just, it's, yeah. And, and I've got two other ones exactly like it. And, and they all play good too, but this one trumpet. It just sounds better. It's really special. It's yeah. just, yeah. You know, I don't, it, it's really hard to describe to a, a, someone who's not a musician and trained ear of a horn and an instrument and how it should sound and how it feels. It's really hard to describe when you pick up a horn and, oh, uh, there is somebody calling in actually. Uh oh. Wait, wait. He's, I gotta, I gotta explain because this is somebody that wants to ask us a question and uh, hold on, Tom. Oh, is it Pulitzer? It is. Okay. Oh, my God. There he is. Tom? Uh, am I on the air? You are. <clears throat> yeah, it's weird. The time sync, you know, it's like uh, uh, the phone call is actually a, a little ahead of a uh, lot of, of time, so I probably missed a sentence or two. But uh, It is. Yeah, John, I was, I was with you, John, when you bought that uh, Shoki, man. I remember that. It was incredible, huh? Yeah, yeah. That was incredible horn, man. And I remember you dropping it. It's like, uh, uh, and I won't tell the rest of the big rat story because I can see you're uncomfortable with it. <laughs> well, you know, I do have a reputation to uphold that's a little different from the one I had before. <laughs> oh, <laughs> 22, 23. Oh, come on. <laughs> we'll tell, people can ask me uh, privately if they ever want to know what that is. No, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, were you were you with me when when we went to um, when we were in Chicago and we were on South Wabash and uh, it was really super hot. It was in the summer, and uh, I walked into this bar to get something to drink because it was super hot. And I asked the guy, "What kind of beers do you have on tap?" And he named all these light beers. And I said, "What about dark beers?" He says, "Oh, we have Guinness." And I think I think. I remember staying there for like four hours or something because I'd never had a whole, uh, um, you know, Guinness from the tap. And back then I would go, you know, just like I do with wine now, you know, um, you know, if I, I like to try different wines and, you know, do some tastings and things, you know, and with the, and with the beer back then it was, it was dark beers and, oh man, that was you know that Chicago run that, that same Chicago run we had to do, I think was it 12, three show days in a row under in the heat. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was fun. I think I lost 30 pounds that day. I mean, that, that week. Je yeah. Jeff, were you on that? I believe so because it was unbearably hot. We were mm -hmm. there. For months. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we just yeah. be in the sauna for all day long playing our horns. Well, that's, that was the trip where the two of you drove, we drove through my hometown of Aurora. Yep. Chicago. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, me. And, and, and John, John made me pull off the road in Kansas to go up pick flowers. Yeah. And that was really neat, man. You know, I, I, there's a certain brand of shrubbery that I really enjoy, you know, staring at, you know, <laughs> Hey, but you know what I remember, you know, not to change the subject, but to change the subject, in, in Nebraska, I had the best roast beef sandwich, and it was from an Arby's. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Jeff, Jeff goes, because Jeff goes, Arby's in Nebraska is not like Arby's in the rest of the country. No, it sure was. isn't. It, it was definitely different. It wasn't Tommy's, but it was, you know... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so what what was the deal with the whole White Castle thing in Chicago? When the White Castle thing was we were there, and um, I guess we had partaken in some alcohol, and we went there, and um, and I I treated everybody to dinner, and and I spent like twenty six bucks in a White Castle in 1981 or whatever it was. And, and if you can imagine, I mean, t I mean, burgers then were like 30 cents or something. Yeah. And so we just, you know, we were just rowdy pigs, you know, 
And some, some guy was, uh, one of the guys, I guess he was, um, he was standing outside the window just looking at us. Just He couldn't believe what he was seeing. And I remember uh, looking at him and snarling, and I spilled my milkshake on the window right in his face, you know. And then, and then he just backed away and took off, you know. Okay, did that make you happy, Tom? Uh, yeah, no, I remember that. I remember that. That was a, that was a very memorable night on the circus. <laughs> that was, you, you know, and we don't want to get too much into the details, but there was a certain uh, John ended up by a uh, by some people's trailer, and we were trying to figure out whose trailer that was that he ended up the being, the Walendas. The Wal- the it was the Walendas. It the High Wire Act. <laughs> so they were one of the nicest people on the tours, on the circus. So yeah. we couldn't have done it. To, we couldn't. We couldn't have disturbed a nicer bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> it was- That's for sure. And I remember that because I remember waking up the next day, and we would, we had to go do a parade. Remember that we did that parade. We were on a float. Oh, we had to be on a truck. We had to be. On yeah. A- yeah, and and um, and there was all these kids, and they were coming up and being really loud to us, and um, yeah, it was really tough. <laughs> it was a tough day. <laughs> Can I? I, I, I want. I have a, a real favorite John Worley story from Cal State LA. I, I want to share. And um, um, Bob, we were both in that. When I got into the A band with John, I was like probably one of the best bands I've ever big bands that I played in collegially I and mean, it was so amazing. And Bob would always throw a party for the band at his house at the end of the the um at the end of the uh year. And so we're over there and, and you know John is you know kind of playing with Bob's young kids and, and finally this this uh, one of Bob's sons is kind of kind of just kind of wanting John's attention and John's trying to hang out with the guys and um John goes, now if you don't behave your daddy's going to put you in the closet and make you play high notes. <laughs> That's one of my favorite. And I could just see this little kid up there. You're not coming out until you hit a D. You know? <laughs> there you go. Get back in the closet. <laughs> Do you remember that, John? Um, there's a lot I don't remember from that time period, Tom. You know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, that's, that's like, I'll never forget that. Yeah, we we're we we're dying. Uh, <laughs> we <were> dying. <laughs> we had, I remember going to a party at uh, Cliff Vargas's house. Yeah, I remember that, too. What was that? I was. Oh, my God. I can't. It was crazy. He, he lived in Bel Air. And so he won he invited he invited the circus to his to his house for a party and, and the only way that he would uh, have us he would invite the bands if we played. And that and so that's what we did, but it was kind of fun. It was it was different, you know. It was nice talking to people, you know, that you don't normally get to associate with. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Man. Circus days. Hey. I'm 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 gonna let you guys talk. I don't want to. Uh, John should talk about all the different people he's played in after the circus. That yeah, that's so right. I'm gonna let you guys keep talking. All right, thanks for calling but, in, Tom. Um, okay, nice to nice to hear your voice, Tom. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, me too. I hope we can see each other soon. No, we will. In twelve. <laughs> all right. Okay. 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 Yeah. Later. Okay, see guys. You, Carry on. All right. All right. So. um uh, which I want to get to a little bit. So who, um, after the circus, you've had this life of playing the horn around the Bay Area, teaching, playing with bands. I know uh, one of the things you've been doing recently, especially is the uh, San Jose Collective. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, San Jose Jazz Collective. Yeah. 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 Tours with that. And um, I think, did I was I able to pull up a couple of pictures? Not yet. Um, uh, but you did an Asian tour and what between, we did two, two Asian tours. Yeah. And so between the circus and, and now give me a little, catch me up with all of the stuff that you've been doing, because I've, 
you, you, between teaching and doing those things and doing being instrumental in the jazz world, especially in the South Bay. You mm -hmm. know, um, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about that. Okay, so um, in 85 to 90, I was the first call sub at the Venetian Room at the Fairmont in with San Francisco with Dick Bright. And, um, and around 88, 89, I started um, thinking, you know, I really want to play jazz. And the only way to really do it is just to jump in. And I'd always played jazz before that, but it was never a thing where I, I felt like, you know, I didn't want to give up playing commercial music because I, you know, I really liked the hang and, 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 you know, it was nice to get paid well, you know, for stuff like doing shows and things. But um, so I started playing with a lot of different people like John Jang. He had a band called the Pan Asian Orchestra. And I remember we, um, we did a lot of really fun gigs. Uh, the most memorable, memorable tour was when we went to uh, Europe and played at the Verona Jazz Festival and at the Zelt Music Fest in, in uh, Freiburg, Germany. Um, I did a handful of different cruise ships and, um, but I've mostly been playing jazz, you know, um, I've played with the Bay Area Jazz Composers Orchestra, a bunch of really fun big bands like Rudy Salvini big band and uh, went out with Woody Herman for a very, very short time. And, um, and that was an interesting experience because I, I um, you know, I had this whole idea of what it would be like to be on the road with one of those kind of bands. And I'd always wanted to do it because my first inspiration was Maynard Ferguson in the Stan Kenton band. Mm -hmm. And so, and when I finally got out there, had a chance to go on the road with the band, I realized right from the get go that it wasn't really for me because the conditions, you know, I mean, I'd already been through the circus, you know, right. and you can't compare uh, uh, the music, part of the uh, of a gig like that with the circus, but it was it was pretty rough. And I just thought, you know what, I want to go home. You know, I just want to do what I do, you know, and so I did. And that's when I was doing, uh, um, I don't know, just different things. I went to I played with the 49er band um, you did. And, the, and the Raiders band, you know, for the football games. And, and, and if I remember right, uh, you did those things it was a pretty good good run for you guys doing that and the band uh, the 49er band in particular was killing mm -hmm. it was a great band great yeah. band yeah, who, who and was, who was some, who of, was some the, of the yeah uh, rich thur was one of the trumpet players um um fred berry bill resch alan smith we the last gig the band did well, we went to Wembley Stadium and did a, um, a exhibition game in in London, and um, and it was let's see, the trumpet section was Alan Smith, who was one of my mentors, and Fred Berry, Tom Bertetta, and myself, and Bill Resch, who was another teacher of mine, mm. and um, and that was a lot of fun. Boy, you know, I haven't been to London since, but I sure would love to go back. You know. You know, uh, I got to tell you one one story that just came up, and I, um, uh, I, <clears throat> talking about you and and your 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 wife and your life in Mountain View. You you still live in Mountain View? Uh, no, I, I live in Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Yeah, I'm. We moved about five years ago. Yeah. Um, when um when I had uh, my my first marriage and and my my first child was. Mm -hmm was to Michaela, who's now in New right, York, right. So mm -hmm. this, this is a, a, a little bit of a funny story. So uh, it was a Christmas Eve. And you had called me to come play at the church, the, the Lutheran, I think it was a Lutheran church in Los Altos. Okay, Christmas Eve service. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went over there and, and uh, the band was sitting up in the front and we were playing the songs and it was a Christmas Eve. And there was this long silence and my daughter Michaela too was was it stood up on her mom's lap and said that's my daddy up there <laughs> <So loud. laughs> and, and I was just thinking man you know I mean but it was one of those things where I loved it because I was you know proud dad but 
but uh, it, it was sort of a beautiful thing as everybody, you know, laughed and had a good time with it. But family has always been important to me and, and it's always been important to me. And, and the, the life you've had with Susan, and I'm going to try to see if I can get this. I, I have your Facebook up and I can, I can try to show this online. Let's see if I can do this. So you can, I want, in case people don't know who, who this, this lady Susan is, uh, you should be able to see this. Um, so this is a picture uh, of you and Susan in a coffee shop, having, holding coffee up and just having a great time. And this is, can you, are you looking? Oh, at yeah, yeah, that, that was in um, uh, San Juan Batista. Oh, you just, yeah. were you gigging down there or? Um, Susan, um, Susan was participating in a art, some kind of art show there or something. Oh yeah, we, well, oh, I remember what we did. We dropped off uh, some stuff uh, for her in, um, there's another city down there. I, I can't remember what it is. Um, anyways, yeah. so. And then so we dropped off her stuff there and then we, you know, we just, you know, we just stopped at this coffee place and it was really great coffee. And, you know, we, and that's usually the way we look when we're hanging out together, laughing about stuff. Well, you know, um, uh, first as a musician, it's always been hard to find somebody that can put up with our antics and our lifestyle. Oh God. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, the, the it seems that you have found I, I mean you how long have you and susan been together now well we've we first started dating july 5th 1993 we had met um a few months earlier than that and um and then uh four years later in 1997 we got married on july 5th so, so July 4th is Independence Day and July 5th is Ball and Chain Day. And that's what, that's what we would joke, you know, joke about that. <laughs> that's funny. All right. So uh, I actually was able to do uh, something else here. Hold on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to put up some other pictures here uh, so I can share with people. Uh, and you have to forgive me for, for floating through your, this is your page. And oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I tried, I tried to pull this up, but this picture is at the Winterfest. Right. That's the jazz collective uh, led by Wally Schnalling. And here we're playing um, the music, a weather report. That. And, yeah. And you, who you don't see is Hariso Vichef behind, behind me. And then uh, Saul Sierra on bass. Okay. That's a great group, man. That, that's the one. That's the group that we went to um, um, Taiwan and played some big festivals there. And then, uh, then the last this last year, we went to um, um, to Yokohama, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, played the Hong Kong International um, Jazz Festival. Then we went to Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and then Taipei. Wow! And played two two gigs in Taipei. Yeah. It, I'm I'm kind of scrolling through some of these uh, pictures you have the SJZ Collective Asia tour. Mm -hmm. What what's it like for you going over to Asia and playing this music and and the uh, what I hear from Jimmy Sanchez and Bob McCarsky, a couple of Bay Area guys, is that and or anybody that's been to Japan or any place that the appreciation of music, especially jazz over there, is way different than it is here. It, it, did you find that to be true? Um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's people kind of respect it a lot more in some ways, you know, I mean, there's some great jazz fans here. I mean, you can't knock them, you know, I mean, they just, there's so many people that support the music and, 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 you know, you God love them, you know, they're just, they're, you know, it's really, it's really great when you see their faces show up at your gig, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and over in, over in Asia, you know, the funniest thing that happened to me over in uh, Japan was um, I would, I would go someplace and people would look at me and start talking to me in Japanese. Right. And only, and I, 
I, I look at them and I say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an American. I don't speak Japanese. I only remember the bad words that my mom taught me when I was really young, you know. <laughs> like, makatari, urasai my wa, you know, and stuff like that, you know. That but um, I, but I tell you what, I, I really, that was a life changer, you know. And one of the things that was that was life changing for me is when we went to Shanghai, we went up to that second tallest building in the world. And, uh, and I'd always wanted to go to Shanghai ever since I heard uh, this tune called uh, 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 Shanghai Skies, I think it was, by um, Joe Jackson. And he was on a, in an album called Big World. And, and, and it was and ever since I heard that song, I always wanted to go to Shanghai. And so when we got there, I went up into that, that tower, that giant tower, and uh, walked all around and looked at the whole city and I had um, and I had that I had Joe Jackson in my phone and I had it in my ear and I'm listening to it I'm almost crying because it's like a, you know it's one of those life dreams that came true mm. you know to be able to experience that and it was really neat because when I and I got a picture of it and of this one cloud it looked like a freaking dragon up in the sky you know it was and I don't know it was just there was something about it that mm. really really got to me you know Mm. but um but but you know i mean you know I mean, it's it's interesting you know the way people live how different things are everywhere in the world that i've ever been you know and um i don't know so i think some people they sh they really need to go and travel and they need to see these things because then they would have a different opinion about the world where they're from and who they are i know? agree 100 percent yeah uh, most based on my travels, which is a, a little limited compared to you and, and Tom and, and some others, um, that my, my limited experiences in other countries shows me that all of those people aren't anything like what you think they are based. If you just stay, like if I would just have stayed in Nebraska mm -hmm. and developed that opinion of people, that opinion is nothing like how they really are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so um yeah people do need to travel a little bit more <laughs> yeah people need to see what the world is like you know they need to see how people live how incredibly fortunate we are in some respects to be living here but how incredibly fortunate they are to be living where they are yeah exactly. you know and experiencing what they what they experience in everyday life you know so you know? now all of this has sort of come to a crash and, but you're still able to do some some students and stuff, though, right? Are you? How's that going? Yeah, yeah. I'm teaching online, and um, the first the first couple of weeks, I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I was so happy to have a break because I teach like 55 students a week. Wow! And play gigs, and you know, I tell you, I'm 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 pretty darn busy, you know, and uh, to the point where I, you know I don't get a chance to go out and play with the people, uh, you know, some of the people that that call me and it's unfortunate because you know they're my friends and i really love playing with them but you know you live in the bay area and it's crazy here it's really expensive to live here and you have to make money to be able to stay you know so but so for the first two weeks i hardly did anything and then i thought well i better you know i better start getting something happening because it looks like we're going to be uh, it's going to be like this you know so you know um so i'm teaching about 35 students a week online, which is something I never did before. And it was really interesting to do it because it, it poses certain challenges uh, audioly and also um, also the from the point of view that when you when you work with a student, you know, you watch how they set up, they watch how they breathe and they do all these things and and you can and you place yourself inside them to see what they feel like when they play so that if they're doing something that could be better or could, you know, could make things a lot easier for them, it would be easier for you to say, you know, to, to, to you know, coach them on these things. Right. And so that's one of the challenges, but I'm working through it and it's actually doing pretty good. You know, it's good. I, I do miss playing and I've had a lot of gigs cancel. You know, um, I have one, one gig that I'm really looking forward to. If it happens, it's a Monterey Jazz Festival. Yeah. And 
I'm hoping that that festival goes because it'll be my 16th time I've had a chance to play that festival. You wow. know, 16 times. Yeah, I've played there with a lot of people. Uh, like, um, I, I mean, backed them up and then also been part of the groups. You know, uh, I backed up Wayne Shorter there. Mm. That was a that was a dream come true. And Don Byron. I remember Jeff Cressman and I did that together. Um, uh, a tribute to uh, Bobby Hutcherson. I think it was Bobby Hutcherson with Billy Childs, McCoy Tyner, oh. Ryan Blades, you know, all these cats. And um, and then I got to, and, and the highlight for me was I got to play there with my band, and, you know, one time. What's, and it was, that was really neat. And what was the name of your band then? It was called Worldview. Mm -hmm. And and I remember Chris Strom was on the band, mm -hmm. and that was her very first time she'd ever played at Monterey. And last year, I got to play Monterey with her band. Oh, that's so. It was really cool. Oh, what a yeah, it was so cool. We did the music at John Shiflet, you know. Yeah. John had passed away, and um, yeah, we all miss him. He was such a phenomenal player. There was something yeah. in his playing that was just yeah yeah it was a great feel yeah yeah so so i hope i hope the festival goes you know i hope all this you know i mean things made things go away for a minute and they come back it's just like when you know when there's a fire you know and everything's burned to the ground then a month later there's new growth coming up and everything we're going to see a lot of new things come up from this and i'm really excited about it because i'm you know i like change i like seeing things happen differently and you know, so I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. I, yeah, I, I'm i probably going to end up doing more of this just because and how I'm going to make money at it. But I'm certainly having fun. <laughs> yeah. And and you got, you know, and you, your personality and your speaking voice and everything is just really terrific for this. You should you should do this. Well, you know, so far, uh, I haven't been too offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just give it time, damn it. Damn <laughs> door, don't let the flies in. God damn it. Close that screen door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really funny, man. But you know, just in this hour that we've been talking, and, and we're we're a little over an hour already. I it, yeah. And, but I think it's really obvious it, to anybody who's tuning in, and I, I can see that we've had a handful of people that have been consistently watching, is if they don't know you, they definitely get a sense of the kind of person you are. And you're, you're big and warm and, and open-hearted and loving, and, and um, you it always were there for me and were always to my rescue if I ever needed help. So... Uh, you're that kind of friend for everybody, not just me. It's just the kind of person you are. And I know that I appreciate that. And, and well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And uh, you know, and you and Susan, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I've actually ever met her. Have I even met her in person? I don't, I don't know. I, I can ask her. Uh, but I know uh, that I, I, from what I see you post and how you two get along, I mean, it, it's magical, you know, and Jeff, you know, she's my dream come true. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah. I think I re remember you saying that, you know, once that makes me, that just brings. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, it's, you know, it's, 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 um, it's wonderful. Yeah. What can I say? You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I put off getting married and, you know, uh, either because I didn't meet the right person or, or I just wanted to play trumpet, you know, and I remember saying to some, some different people, you know, you know, I love you, but, you know, I'm a trumpet player and, you know, I'm always going to play my trumpet and trumpet comes first. You know, that never really goes well with anybody. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've had that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, so now, you know, I mean, she's my better half, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate, very fortunate, you know, she's one of the kindest people I've ever met, you know, so, and she's got a lot of patience, you know, because as you well know, you know, you have to have a lot of patience to be around me sometimes, you know? <laughs> or, oh yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, 
uh, it's the it's the the musicians it's the the job we do the work we do and the the kind of the lifestyle that we have isn't necessarily um something that a a regular person uh can relate to you know so yeah it, ta- it does take patience too. Well, yeah where, where, where are you getting your money this week <laughs> <laughs> that check coming from uh <laughs> yeah well you know there's there's more things important in life than money you know money and wealth and and you know and as long as she and i can keep it going you know keep 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 things going on a good pace you know we're going to be fine you yeah. know yeah it doesn't matter how much money we have or don't have you know yeah yeah all right well john i i appreciate you being here thank you so much i'm going to take us out in our in my usual way and and uh uh, we can talk a little bit after I close the show, but uh, thank okay. you for being here. And I know that a lot of people tuned in and, and enjoyed listening to us talk about uh, some of our, our old antics. And <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, John. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And, and, you know, I hope not too much time goes by before we get a chance to give each other a big hug. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. The <laughs> virtual, virtual now. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, man.